Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast. I have with me today, Laura Conklin, who is an experienced legal nurse consultant, experienced expert witness, drawing on a lot of years, taking care of patients and being in management positions in a variety of settings. Welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity to share my many experiences. Well, remember, we only have 30 minutes, Laura, so that <laughs> we, could, we could talk forever. Laura has been one of the people who's had a rich experience in nursing with acute care, uh, home care, rehab, a variety of, of types of setting. And you got into legal nurse consulting at a somewhat of a later point in your life. Laura hired me to edit her book that she wrote while she was taking my book authoring mastery course. So I had an opportunity to understand her career in depth. And I know that you came into this after you had several years of experience. What got you started in legal nurse consulting? Actually, it was, it was kind of by accident. Uh, I was working at the time in long-term care as a clinical specialist, and one of the case managers' husband was very good friends with an attorney. And it, we had a lot of brain-injured patients, traumatic brain injury, and um, he said, you know, I've got a case that would be perfect for you to help me with. And I said, sure, why not? So I did. And this was from a very prominent area law firm. So that was a little nerve wracking to begin with. But after I got into the details of the case and reading some of the depositions, uh, I said, this, this is not what happened. This is exactly what didn't happen. Somebody lied. So the attorney that was on the case, um, I had to convince him that this isn't true, that this is impossible. So I had to literally show him that in this instance, this was a girl who was 16 years old with brain damage from uh, an accident. She was slowly regaining her consciousness where she would recognize some people, open her eyes and things like that. She was in the process of getting a bed bath and she got chilled and spazzed and rolled face first into the pillow. The nurse's aide who was giving her the bath left the room didn't notice till she came back and found the patient unresponsive. Rolled the patient back, called the nurse at that point, but didn't do it in a really rapid manner. So when the nurse arrived, she said, you know, call the code, the whole nine yards. And of course the patient was not viable. And mm -hmm. in looking at the exhibits that were produced, I had to convince this attorney that this is not right. This nurse's aide didn't leave this patient like this. This is what more likely than not happened. So we did go to trial on that case. And it was demonstrated by way of uh, an artist who drew exactly how the supposedly the nurse's aide left the patient and how the patient would have been impossible to turn 180 degrees on her own. So... Um, all those details kind of played in helping us win that. And from there, I got several other cases uh, from that one attorney and then from other attorneys in that law firm. And that's kind of how I got started because I was very detail oriented. And I think that's one of the real keys is you really got to watch the details. It doesn't make sense or doesn't it make sense. It sounds like you started in the field as an expert witness. Is that right? Yes, that's right. There are a lot of questions new people who are coming into the field have in terms of how do they get started? What if they don't have somebody like you mentioned who's who was connected to an attorney, the attorney was looking for an expert. Do you have any advice for people who want to get in a law firm, maybe not literally at the moment, but figuratively, in order to be able to develop a relationship with an attorney? I think one of the most important things is have faith in what you know, what you don't know. And I think this is the biggest issue. 
sending, I think, letters, and I've done this, not huge amounts, but, you know, uh, if I saw an advertisement by an attorney, or let's say medical malpractice, and I like the ad, I, I like the, you know, the chemistry in the ad, that he really cares about what he's doing, I would send a letter that, you know, I possibly may help you with some of your cases. This is my background, my experience. And uh, just about every letter that I've sent out, because they were, you know, they were focused on a field of, meta, you know, of malpractice. Uh, I got responses and I, I received cases. I don't mm -hmm. advertise. So I think getting started is everybody knows somebody who knows a lawyer and get to know them. And maybe that's not their field with medical malpractice, but lawyers talk to lawyers. Do a presentation for the law firm on what are some of the things a legal nurse consultant can do. And the association, the American Association of Legal Nurse Consultants has a whole a lot of information that you could share with attorneys that they may not even be aware of, that these are things you can assist with, putting exhibits together, helping with the, putting questions together for a deposition of a new nurse or an experienced nurse. So there's a lot of things that you can do to get started with it, but the most important thing is how you present yourself as somebody who has confidence and somebody who has that knowledge base. They want to know what you know about nursing. They don't really care what you know about the law, but they want to know what you know about nursing and how willing are you to support your opinion. I found that attorneys taught me a lot about the law as I got more experience working with them. And whenever they would use a term that I didn't know, I would debate, well, do I reveal my ignorance by saying, what is it that you just said? Or do I ask? And I learned I learned a lot more just by asking. And attorneys were eager to teach. Yes. You mentioned being detail-oriented as an important skill that you possess. What other skills do you think make a successful legal nurse consultant? <laughs> Time management and organization. My husband used to say, I'm so organized, I'm disorganized. <laughs> But you have to keep those details. From the very first case I started, I, I, you know, who's the attorney? How do you get a hold of them? Who's the paralegal? What are the phone numbers? I've asked the attorneys for their cell number in case I have a question that only they can answer, not their secretaries. And readily I got these. So if you keep those details on your cases, what was the case about? Was it a defense case or was it a plaintiff case? So, you know, the more details you have, including the judge's name, the case number, if you have that type of information, you can go back over the years and say, well, this was a similar case to XYZ that I had 10 years ago. Well, what was that? What did I do that one? What was different than this case? Because all those differences make, you know, help the attorneys put their case together. The details in the case, you have to go back and know not only what the complaint is, you have to think of it almost from the other side. If it's a plaintiff case, well, what would the defense be for this case? Why, would they, why did they do what they did? Was there extenuating circumstances? Was there nothing else that could have been done? Or was it just plain a negligent, attack, a negligent um, error? Or was it something that the nurse just didn't know what she was doing? That happens too. So, you know, when you get into those little details, looking at it from both sides, then you can give an honest opinion, not just because it's a plaintiff case, so you've got to find a mistake. Sometimes you don't. The plaintiff's attorney knows what he's been told and what the medical records say. It's your job as a legal nurse consultant to sort all that out, to point out the, the real issues, because some attorneys are experienced and they'll tell you what's what. Others are not that experienced. So they expect you to tell them that, no, this doesn't work this way. This is what happens in a real hospital. This is what will happen in a nursing home. Because it's a lot of misunderstanding. And sometimes plaintiff attorneys have family members or patients who are very persuasive, but leave out a few details oh, yeah. which impact 
the case or their facts are off and the medical record doesn't support what they say happened or the medical record may be deliberately blank and missing specific information that the patient says happened. There's all those nuances which legal nurse consultants love because we love putting those pieces of the puzzle together to figure out what happened in a situation. So you've talked about being detail oriented, you talked about organized and time management. Before we talk about time management, all of the details that you're discussing, did you have paper files? Did you have a database? I mean, how did you keep track of all that information about the law firm and the cell phones numbers and those things that you were just describing? When I, this is funny because when I first started, I got these really big index cards and wrote all this out by hand with all the information on the back of it, the dates I reviewed cases and, and what, you know, the, the, the contact people were, the families and all this. And then it's after a while that turned over to a, an Excel program, which works really well, mm -hmm. or even a table where you can just put in your columns for is, you know, what date were you contacted? That's important. You will always be asked that in a deposition who your attorney is that you're working with and as much detail as far as their address, their contact numbers, things of this nature. What's the case about? That's important to know. And if, you know, are you, have you given a deposition? Have you been to trial on this particular case? Because at some point you're going to be asked that too. How many depositions have you given? How many trials have you testified at? especially if you're a testifying expert witness, yes. that's always going to come up. So if you keep those track of that sort of things, it makes it a lot easier to put your hands on it. I used to keep a table. I believe it was four years. I kept four years worth of information and then dropped off the older years. Or as soon as I had to update it, I would delete data from before the four year period just because I realized the more data I had on that chart that I didn't have to have, the more I was giving the attorney who wanted that information. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned time management. What does that mean within the context of working with attorneys? Oh, that's such an interesting concept because I have gotten so many cases that, well, could, could you, you know, could you let me know by Friday? Friday, how long have you had this case? Years. So a lot of times you just have to, once you start the case, put the set aside, you know, at least three, four hours block of time that you may be able to finish it from the beginning. Because when you're going back and forth and every time you start again, you have to kind of review the key, yeah. the key elements. What I ended up doing was keeping a chronology, just doing a timeline day by day. Well, you know, at nine o'clock, this is the, and put the nurse's name in, and this is what the founding was. You're not rewriting the chart, so you don't need to do it in that kind of detail. But then when you review this case again, couple, you know, maybe a couple hours or a couple days before a deposition, this brings back all this memory to you because you're not going to review the entire record all over again. And some of these cases take a while to actually get to a deposition state. So you have to put the time where you're not being bothered and you're not being disrupted when you're reviewing because that, that's important. And mm -hmm. then track your time. Have you run into situations where the attorney thought that the number of hours that it took you to review the materials was excessive? Oh, yes. I have had that happen. Um, you know, and, and this one attorney said, well, you didn't have to look at everything. I said, but you sent me everything. And you don't know what I need. When I question a finding, I need to go to the lab. I need to go to the x-rays. I need to go with what did the physical therapist say? Because all this is going to impact the decision that somebody's going to make, whether there's merit or not to this case. And you ask for my opinion. And if that's what I need to look at, this is what it's going to be. And it's, Again, when you get into those details and you find something that's one of those aha uh -huh moments, they don't complain anymore. 
That's true. By being thorough and detail oriented, you can find things that the attorney missed or mm -hmm. contradict the position that the attorney is taking. Definitely. Do you think that there are people who have myths about being a legal nurse consultant, perhaps nurses who are coming into the field and hold certain myths or misconceptions? Oh, I've talked to many of them. <laughs> Taking a course, okay, I'm going to do this. I can work in my pajamas and make $150 an hour. No, <laughs> that's not reality. Reality is it's a lot of work. You have to build your reputation, and this is what's going to keep you busy. If you're very good at it, you will get referrals. Lawyers talk to lawyers. They want to know who's the expert. It's interesting, I found, that within the same law firm, they don't always want to share that information because they want to keep you as their expert, and they don't want to share you with somebody else that may take up your time where you're not going to be available. Hmm. But there is myths in you know, that this is just a marketing tool, or if you're hired by a plaintiff, that you're going to say whatever the plaintiff's attorney wants you to say. That's not how you build a reputation. You build your reputation by being objective. And in some cases, that's hard to do. Because there are two sides to every story. And whether it's a defense attorney, or whether it's a plaintiff's attorney, you're only hearing one side. So you have to fill in the gap. And if you can support your opinion by current literature, but you have to make sure the literature corresponds with the time frame of the incident. If it happened in 2017, you can't post um, an article written in 2020 because they didn't read it yet. So, you know, you have to be, you know, that detail oriented as far as what you're presenting to support your opinions as well. And have you, I assume, had an opportunity to go to court to testify as an expert? Oh, many times. It's scary. If, if I were to ask you, what was a memorable case that you were involved in, which, in, which included going to court to testify, what comes to mind? It's, um, well, there are, there are a couple of them, but one of the... Uh, tricks that I learned from one of the forensic pathologists is in depositions and in trial, you're quite often asked a question like, well, just answer the question, yes or no. If you say, I can't answer that, yes or no, that disqualifies you as an expert in some jurors' minds, possibly. So you turn that around by saying that question can't be answered, yes or no, because then begs the question, why not? And I've had that happen a couple of times in trial where the judge will say, well, why can't you say yes or no to that? Well, then, I, then I've got all the time to explain it. Mm -hmm. One case in particular dealt with uh, a lady who had arthritis really bad in her knees, and they just wanted to do a scope her knee and make sure everything is okay before they decide to whatever. Fix it. They uh, did the wrong knee. Oh. This was a new nurse learning OR techniques, and she had put the stuff down, and typical orthopedic surgeon ran in and said, come on, come on, let's get this going, let's set this up, and he set up the frame for the leg, put the leg in it, and, and everything went on, and they started the procedure, and the anesthetist stood up and said, what side are you doing? And he said, the left side. She says, well, the consent says right side. Uh-oh. Tear everything down, start all over again on the correct knee. Well, in the process of this trial, the defense attorney for the hospital just kind of mentioned, well, that's no big deal. They just inject a little bit of fluid in there. And yeah, so, you know, it was no big deal. She wasn't harmed. She's up walking. Now you can see her walking. The lady asked for $25,000 to cover her expenses of having to have somebody drive her around because now she couldn't walk, take care of her at home, et cetera. Not a whole huge amount of money. The, what we did for this one is we put an exhibit together that showed this three liter bag of fluid that's run through your knee that takes all those miscellaneous twists and turns your knee settles into with arthritis all blown apart. They don't come back the same way. We had a picture of the needle involved, the cannula, and all this tubing and fluid 
and said, no, this really expanded everything where it didn't really come back the same way it was before they started. The jury awarded us lady $250,000. So that was a very nice settle for her and it's not what she expected. But Mm -hmm. it worked. That was a memorable case. Oh, it certainly was. That old right versus left, that gets us in trouble all the time. They never did one of those like they're supposed to. What side are we doing? Wasn't Mark. They just, I felt bad for the surgeon, but hey, you screwed up, you screwed up. And was it the expectation at that time that the surgeon would be marking the site in advance? Yes, actually, that was started around 1988 by Joint Commission that not only, you know, that was that time out before surgery. So everybody went through, this is the patient, check the R band, make sure you got the right patient. This is the procedure. This is the side we're doing it on. And that didn't happen. For whatever reason, everybody was in a hurry, particularly the surgeon. Mm -hmm. Well, he makes waste. Mm -hmm. If somebody asked you for, what were some of the most useful tips that you could share about being a legal nurse consultant or being an expert witness? What guidance would you give a person who's asking that question? Well, being an expert witness was terrifying the first couple of times because when you review a case, even when you go a deposition, you have your notes, you have the chart, you have the medical records, you have everything you need. When you're in trial, you have yourself and a good memory. A good, they say a good lawyer doesn't ask a question he doesn't know the answer to. Well, that sometimes does happen. So you have to be prepared if you're going to explain in layman's terms to a jury of what should have happened, what happened, what didn't happen. You have to keep that in mind. You, you're not going to impress anybody by having uh, an extensive medicalese language. That's not what they want. They want to understand what's going on so they can make their decision. So I think keeping it simple, keeping it English. I have no trouble talking. As you can tell, I have trouble shutting up sometimes. So when you go to a deposition, you answer only what is asked. And again, that comes in really handy. If you don't really want to answer that question, ask them to repeat it. Could you rephrase that? I I didn't understand what you're asking. You know what they're asking. You may not want to say it. So after the fifth or sixth, never mind. We move on. And you get your point across without opening up that slippery slope of opening your mouth and sticking your foot in. So you have to be careful, and it comes with practice. Um, I've given oh, well over 100 depositions, so I, they know me <laughs> in the area. They, they don't go there. They just know me. They just go to the point, and, you know, and sometimes you're asked that. What, what do you think? What are the issues in this case? Well, you should know that. You should have a little summary for yourself that this is what you want to make sure. These are the key points that you don't want to skip. You want to make sure, even if you have to sneak them in sometimes, you want to make sure those key points are said. And again, yes, I, I was too. delighted in sneaking in comments that I wanted to. If I saw an opening that would reinforce my opinion, and if you're alert to it and you're listening for those opportunities, you can spot them and just whoosh, Slide it in. Doesn't make them happy, but it works. <laughs> Very definitely. So being careful, you mentioned that you have no trouble talking, but sometimes the trouble is stopping talking. The issue of volunteering information must have been a challenge in the beginning to know when to cut the answer short. Oh, yes. Learn that the hard way. What the one attorney that I work with the most, you know, he always just say, they, they're going to take you down that primrose path. So pay attention. And that's really key is you've got to, your mind is already working and giving an answer. You don't want that. You want to mm-hmm. listen to the question because they'll say things like, well, the sky, you would agree that the sky is blue, wouldn't you? Of course. 
you would agree that, you know, this wall is painted beige, wouldn't you? Yes, of course. And this carpet is gray. Yes. And then they sneak in a question, well, then you'd agree that so-and-so happened during this. Uh, nope. <laughs> <laughs> then they start all over again with, okay, let's try this another way. And it's like, you know, you can keep doing this, but you're not going to get a different answer. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I'm laughing because I testified for 25 years as an expert witness. And those techniques that you're describing are ones that I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, what I found interesting one time was that a young attorney who probably had never done a deposition before took my deposition and he was earnestly asking me questions and he got interrupted or cut off by the attorney who hired me and he looked at that attorney and said I have to ask you that question because I only get one bite at the apple and I thought yeah I know what that means but when you're the apple you kind of you don't want anybody biting me <laughs> you didn't have to say that to my face I'm not an apple I am a witness <laughs> oh I just laughed and, and some of them that I've had in that position, especially older lawyers, they, you know, they get really riled up and start getting literally yelling at you. And, and uh, that situation happened in trial once that this lawyer was just getting so worked up and well, you said this and in your deposition, you said he's getting louder and louder to so the judge said, why are you yelling at this nice lady? <laughs> so sometimes they get carried away. It's, it's an emotional situation, you know. But yeah, you it is. learn the hard way to just answer the question. Unless you want to sneak in that little tidbit that you want to make sure. And then you can always say, oh, I must have misunderstood what you were asking. I thought you were asking me if so-and-so made a mistake. And yeah, they did. <laughs> I have fun. The artful response. Ah, yes. <laughs> well, I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast that we work together on your book. Can you give our listener the title of your book and what it's about and where our listener can get a copy of it. Sure. The title of my book is Shocking Stories of Nursing, Memoirs of a 50-Year Nursing Career. It's available on Amazon, either electronic form or printed copy. And uh, after I did the, because I wanted to share what I did. I did a lot in nursing. I worked every field. And I wanted to make sure that I wanted to point out to new nurses that there's a whole world out there. You could, divide, you could decide and develop your own career if you're really passionate about something in the field. So this can happen very easily, you know, but it's, it's that dedication that I wanted to make sure that people understood that, yeah, things happen good, some they don't. I learned a lot of lessons along the way, and I shared them in that book. Mm -hmm. After re working with the Department of, actually the Licensing Bureau in Michigan, which does part of the Board of Nursing Licensing, I reviewed uh, allegations against nurses when uh, errors happen, mistakes happen, they, they do in life. And so I decided to do a sequel to the book, More Shocking Stories of Nursing. What were they thinking? And that deals with some of those allegations and how they were handled, what the board did, what happened to the nurse, what happened, what were the circumstances around why they did what they did. So it was kind of, a, it's an interesting group of stories that really point to the nurse's importance of don't straight too far from the basics. Nursing mm -hmm. is still nursing. You have shared so many tips today, Laura. I appreciate you very much. It sounds like you've had some interesting cases to work on and have enjoyed being part of this exciting field. Definitely. It, it, it's, you know, if, if you love what you do, you never really work that hard. And, but it is something that I'm passionate about the profession. It's such a, it's been very nice to me. It's been very good to me. And like I said, I've worked, I loved every, every area that I've worked in nursing. And that's something that I would like to encourage people. If you're thinking about nursing, this is, this is a good book to read. See what happened to me. 
especially the early days. Oh, oh very <laughs> different. <laughs> well, thank you, Laura, for being a guest on Legal Nurse Podcast. And thank you to you who's been watching this podcast on our Legal Nurse Business channel or listening to it on the audio platforms. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel. And if you are listening to this on the audio channels, be sure to leave a review and tell your colleagues what you think of the program. We appreciate you as our listener and wish you much success as a legal nurse consultant. Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast. I have with me today, Dr. David Mathis, who works within the correctional facility environment. And we've just spent 30 minutes talking about some of the factors that are different behind the walls than on the street. Dr. Mathis, what would you summarize from our conversation so that our listener will understand what our show is going to be about? These cases are different. While they may have standard of care issues, these are largely civil rights cases, 1983 cases, deliberate indifference cases that are tried in, well, that are out of federal court. They rarely go to trial because they depend on the, uh, the reports from the experts as well as the depositions. And then they ultimately uh, are negotiated and uh, uh, settlements are made. They're a different breed of case than the standard of care case that might happen in your, your county because they're all in federal court, all in the different districts. Well, thank you. We made some crucial distinctions in this podcast. And also, uh, Dr. Mathis shared some stories that help illustrate the differences in the ways that these things are resolved within the correctional system and when the legal system combines with that. Be sure to watch for the podcast with Dr. David Mathis on correctional facility, standard of care, and civil rights cases.